Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Eddie Blankers, and um, uh, thank you very much for having me here. This is my first time uh, at Swinock. Um, actually, um, I'm more in the security area, working more in the area of IT security than in the networking world, but um, in a certain sense, we are neighbors, and I have to work together with our network team to get or to achieve certain security goals. So this talk is about DNS and how DNS servers can be hardened so they are not as useful for an attacker um, for a DDoS attack. I take it that everybody here in the room has um, observed a DDoS at least once, maybe more often, with uh, varying um, uh, bandwidths. Before diving into that, actually, I'm working for the Canton of Argo as a security specialist. That means I'm working with our IT staff to um, implement all security measures that we can to protect our network against attacks. That includes network attacks like a DDoS, but also attacks against uh, servers or workstations, uh, especially malware. Um, I'm also a PCAP addict, I have to admit. Um, I'm speaking at Sharkfest once in a while, and um, there's also that little blog called uh, packetfoo.com where I sometimes write about whatever I encounter. A good DDoS, or, or, the, or all the DDoS attacks that I have um, uh, analyzed, often hold a, to a certain part DNS packets. And what the attackers use is something we call a DNS reflection attack. Um, and just a quick uh, recap of how a DNS reflection attack works. We have here a number of infected hosts. Um, that could be anything from a home router or a computer running some type of malware, a compromised web server, whatever there is. And we have a bot master sitting here who is sending commands to all his infected machines. And for a typical DDoS or a DNS reflection attack, the infected hosts will send DNS requests with a spoofed source address, so with a forged source IP address, so that the DNS response will be sent to the victim. So um, in a usual scenario, the client will send a very small DNS request, which could be as little as 80 byte, and generate a large response that will hit the target. And the bandwidths that can be achieved are uh, easily within a terabyte uh, of bandwidth, so I guess that will hurt you no matter how big your network is. Um, we cannot do anything to protect ourselves against that. So I, I cannot do anything as a, as a victim when I can work with my ISP to implement some type of rate limiting um, and uh, uh, filter the traffic that comes in. But actually, ultimately, what I want to do is um, I want to eliminate the DNS servers here from the equation and so um, stop that attack. And this is what this talk is about. First of all, if we look at a DDoS attack from a packet level, remember I'm, I am a PCAP addict, um, this is what I see as a victim of a DDoS. I see a ton of DNS responses, and here in this case, um, the domain pscore.gov was used um, uh, for, uh, for the attack. So we receive a total of three IP packets, um, with a total of more than, than 4,000 bytes, and we get 30 DNS answers, and you see here the DNS payload 4,081 bytes. If we reconstruct the request, we get a 71 byte IP packet, um, and that includes the DNS header, the, uh, the DNS packet itself, IP header, and UDP header. And all that 71 byte generate a total of 4,150 bytes uh, in a response. So the traffic generated by this attack is amplified by 58 times. So that is very favorable for the attacker. So I only need a very small request to generate a large packet. And this is what makes a DNS uh, attack very, very effective. Now, there are a number of um, factors that contribute to the effectiveness of the attack. 
So first of all, the resolver is sending 4K DNS messages. Now we can limit the size of the UDP message to something smaller by configuring our DNS server. And it's up to you to decide, well, do I need the 4K packet or could I make it somewhat smaller, say 2,000 bytes would be enough. That by itself would eliminate a lot of um, uh, packets and make it less uh, attractive for, make your DNS server less attractive for the attacker. The second point is this special DNS server is responding to queries for any. The any record is not just one record, but it would deliver, depending on the implementation and the state of the DNS server, certain information. You will typically get like an address record, um, maybe a quad A record if one is there, um, the, the SOA record, NS record, and more. Um, Best practices published by ISCs and, and others recommend to turn off responses for any, and we will soon come to a, to a method that allows you to get responses for any, but just make it not effective, make not part of a DNS, uh, of a reflection attack. Obviously, this DNS server is responding to every query that it gets. So just sit down for a second and um, imagine you have a client asking the same DNS question over and over again. Like every millisecond or so, you receive the same question. That makes absolutely no sense at all. DNS responses are cached for a good reason, so clearly there is no type of rate limiting active here. And the last point that we have to observe is, well, it's an open resolver, but we never know if that resolver is intentionally open or if it is a misconfiguration from the of, uh, by the operator. When analyzing traffic, I notice three types of um, uh, DNS reflectors that are more or less common. So one set is we have open resolvers that just respond to anyone. Typical open resolvers are like 1.1.1, 1 .1 .1, 999, or 8.8.8. .8 .8. .8. Um, these DNS servers are open by design, and the operators have put or took great care to make sure that they cannot be abused for this type of attack. So they will stop responding to the client if the same question is repeated over and over again. There is a second group of um, DNS reflectors, which are authoritative name servers. These are the name servers which hold the responsibility for a domain like swinoc.ch or, or google.com or whatever domain you have. And um, they will not respond to every question, but only they will only answer questions dealing with the domains that are hosted on that domain server or the servers they are authoritative for. And some of these name servers rec lack rate limiting, and that makes them also a great uh, uh, reflector. The third group are company internal servers, and these company internal servers, well, they, sh they should respond to everything, so they would be servers used by all clients uh, in the organization, and they will resolve all hosts. Well, but sometimes you have a malware infection inside of the company. Now, in these days, it's usually ransomware that makes the news, but still, you can have a client that sends a DNS request to your company internal name server with a forged source IP address, and your firewall does not um, support some type of egress filter, so that packet goes out and you have a great uh, reflector. So to make a name server less useful for the bot master, um, well, a, a good idea is to implement rate limiting. Actually, the Internet Systems Consortium is advising that for ages now. Um, if your DNS implementation does not support rate limiting, I'm sure you can find um, a pol you can configure a policer or any other type of QoS measure to limit the, the rate of traffic. Um, uh, implement egress filter, well, that is especially important for uh, company networks. Um, and then you should not send out responses to the any records because any records can be as big as you can imagine. That could be like your 4K response. Some servers will only send 2K in response, but that's still a, uh, a good um, uh, amplification factor for an attacker. 
And unfortunately, what I've noticed is that not all DNS servers are run by real professionals, but by users who um, read like um, your average newspaper, which is uh, on the same level like, a, well, it's a car magazine, and here's something for a computer magazine. I go for the computer magazine, and well, um, there's a quote around, which I heard some 30 years ago, it still holds true. Um, amateur system managers are like amateur brain surgeons. They're no survivors. So open resolvers, like the ones listed here, Quad 1, Quad 9, I think, um, they are all good resolvers because they have implemented good rate limiting and we cannot abuse them for an attack. So this is, for me, an example where I feel like, oh, I should find out how they are configured and I should orient my own configuration and, and use them uh, as an example for me. Um, we have the authoritative name servers. And they're interesting for a bot master, especially if they respond to any records. So um, if you need any records, if you feel you need responses to the any record uh, for troubleshooting purposes, you want to make sure they will only be sent uh, through TCP, and we will get to that in a minute. Um, a domain becomes really interesting for a domain for a bot master if it is signed with uh, so if DNSSEC is implemented. Now DNSSEC is a good thing to have. Unfortunately, it makes your DNS responses bigger because just the, the DNS response in itself, the, um, uh, the signatures are just a lot bigger than your your simple A record, for example. Um, Company internal name servers are often overlooked by the internal network staff because just by design, well, what can happen? These systems sit behind a firewall, so nobody would attack them directly. They will not receive a DNS, server, a DNS request from the internet directly. But um, one of the assumptions that I work on always is my system might be compromised. So the, the um, uh, pragma here is assume compromise. So it might be that I have an internal host that is compromised with malware, and this one is spoofing a re sending a spoof request to my internal name server. Now, that response goes out, and my firewall should block it. Actually, that is, for me, a clear indicator of either a bad um, misconfiguration or an infection if one of my hosts is transmitting with the spoofed source address something. So if, if a foreign IP address appears as a source IP address in my internal network, something is clearly wrong. But not all um, operators look for, for that type of traffic or design their firewall rules. So if you have a firewall rule that just allows, allows all outgoing traffic, well, then your company internal name server um, can help in an attack. So I want to find out if my DNS server is somehow useful for an attacker, and I want to reduce the value for an attacker after making configuration changes. So how can I do that? So option one is get infected, download some malware, become part of a botnet, and see what happens. Well, that is not really a good idea, because you don't want to have malware in your network. So I try to find a tool that helps me to check the rate limiting to find out what can an attacker do with my own name server. And I didn't find a tool, so I sat down and wrote my own one, which is called DNS Hammer. And that's what I'm going to present to you. Um, I'm using it for two purposes. One is I run DNS Hammer on my own server to see, well, is it a good reflector? Can anybody abuse that name server? And how valuable is it for a bot master? The second is I try to explore how other operators configure their name servers and get ideas if um, uh, I want to copy whatever they did to my own configuration. So here we go. Let's start with a little thing. There's DNS hammer at work. What you see here is the main program for, for DNS Hammer. And we have three sections. The most important one is to start with is what I call an, an NS finder. And I just type in a domain name here, and I use swinog.ch, and we are now sending DNS requests to three different name servers. You'll see here 1.1.1, 8.8.8, and 9.9.9. And we're sending them 
just a query for the name server. First, first, I have to find out what are the authoritative name servers for this domain. And what we get is, say, ns1.scion.ch, um, an IP address starting with 194 or something. A right click on that domain, so be careful to use only the IP4 uh, uh, version 4 address. IP4 v6 will come in um, probably beginning next year. So I right click on the line with the IP version 4 address of a name server here, and I select test forward lookup. Now that IP address plus the domain name get copied here to the section forward lookup. And we send it a collection of, say, five requests for an address record, five requests for quad A, five any records, 30 random requests with random na uh, names, and five times an MX record. And the default is currently at 15 seconds, so we are sending that for 15 seconds. So that message goes out, and you'll see that in total, we're sending 50 requests per second, and we're getting back here five times the orange line is indicating um, that we have truncated responses, where the server goes like, well, I have some information for you, but you have to use TCP to, to get that information. Now, TCP cannot be used by a bot master for a reflection attack, because it's stateful, and the attack system will not respond properly to the TCP request. So that response is pretty small. Let's see how that turns out in terms of byte per second. And you'll see that the green line indicates the number of bytes that I've sent out, about 3,800 or 3,900 per second. And the response is at about 6,000. I have here a third tab that gives me um, a report. And I switch back to my presentation because it's a bit easier to read. So that's just what we did before. Um, during a test that, I'd commit, uh, uh, that I did a bit earlier, or during the present preparation of that uh, presentation, I encountered that I've sent 2,300 requests. I got 2,300 responses, which tells me, well, traffic-wise, nothing got dropped. And I've received 600 um, uh, truncated responses, which is exactly what I expected from my uh, original test. And the amplification factor for that special name server would be 1.6. So an attacker could amplify traffic by the factor of 1.6 um, just by sending requests to that server. Now, that's not a lot. Actually, I find this is a very good configuration, which really is not a useful configuration for an attacker. So if I were in the business of, uh, of DDoS attacks, I would ignore this name server. Now, let's have a look at a different server. I'm now switching to an outpost of mine, which is sitting in Germany. We, I'm currently, uh, I have tethered my, netbook, uh, my, my notebook to the, to the cell phone sitting there on, on my chair. Um, and when I'm using my Swisscom Wi-Fi through, or my Swisscom connection through the cell phone, um, UDP traffic gets limited. So I'm getting very, very weird results. So now I've used the VPN connection to a host of mine in, uh, somewhere in, in Germany, and I'm using now a gigabit link, unlimited, with no rate limiting and nothing, and going out um, to, uh, uh, with my DNS checks. Now let's see what happens. Uh, I've selected now the domain switch .ch. Um, and I hope you guys don't mind if I use your Pummel, your DNS server for a few seconds. Um, let's start with the server scsnms.switch. I've already pre-filled that to, sh to uh, um, uh, speed up the, the presentation. So we have here an IP address already located for a name server, and I'm sending that to my test configuration. Uh, I change the setup just a little. I will send 10 queries for the address record, 20 queries for the quad A, 40 queries making up random addresses. Oh, sorry. It should be 20. And this should be 80. And 160 queries for the mail record. One. Six zero. 
Here we go. And I limit the test to 10 seconds because, well, that should be enough. Usually, you get, a, you get a, uh, an understanding of the configuration within four or five seconds. So it, it's really a quick test. Let's see. Click Go, and off we go. You see we're sending out 310 requests per second. And the big, vast majority of responses is already carrying the truncated flag. Just by seeing that orange line so, uh, very close to the blue line, I know that the majority of responses is carrying the truncated flag. Now, the truncated flag is an indicator from the DNS server, like, well, I have the information that you desire, but you have to pick it up through, t through TCP. So there is, um, this is not very useful for, uh, for an attacker. We can look at the relationship between transmitted and received bytes, and we see, well, it's 20,000 bytes sent by my test tool, and we get back something around 25 or 30,000 bytes per second. And in the report section, we get the breakdown, and we see here the amplification factor is 1.5. So not very useful for an attacker. Notice that this DNS server has the destination IP 130 point something. Now let's go for a different DNS server, which is ns3.switch and rerun the, re the same test. We use exactly the same parameters, and we hit it again for 10 seconds. Now look what happens. There is no truncation at all, so that server is using a completely different policy. Um, I'm getting responses, and if I look at it from the perspective of byte per second, we see still the same amount of byte going out, but a significantly larger amount of byte coming back. So the reflection factor is much higher. And I don't know if that is intentionally, or if you wrote down a policy and go like, well, I am happy with that server sending more responses or more data than uh, the, the other two DNS servers. But that is the type of configuration that I'm, I'm chasing and feel like, am I happy with that? Of course, it's up to you as, as a DNS operator to say, like, yes, it's exactly what I want to use. So if I look at the report here, remember the last one had an amplification factor of 1.5. This one has an amplification factor of 7.4, which is slightly higher. So as a DNS bot or as a bot master who is in the in the business of delivering DDoS attacks, I would consider this one more important for me as a bad guy than the first DNS server. Personally, I find it interesting to to test different domains. Uh, and, and learn especially from the configuration of, um, of well, let's say, an internet registrar. Let's go for ripe.net. Who of you has ever looked at the DNS configuration of ripe? One, two, three. Is, is a representative of ripe present here? No? Okay. Well, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to step on your toes here. But let's start with the DNS server, which is called menus.authdns.ripe.net. So again, I select the IPv4 address, right-click and go for test forward lookup. And I'm using the same configuration as before. Notice that we have 10 address records, 20 quad A records, 40 random addresses, or 20, 40, 40 random uh, DNS names, 80 any records, and 160 MX records. We run the test for 10 seconds, hit go. Now, a spike like that indicates a problem, a slight problem in timing. Like, this program collects information in one second intervals and then visualizes it. So we had here a one second interval where a lot less information came in, but it came in delayed, so in the next one second interval, we got like a spike that looks a bit higher. And now, this server, I'm sending out about 20,000 bytes per second, and I'm getting back here around 100,000 bytes per second. Or if I look at the report, um, it will tell me the amplification factor is five. Not as useful as the switch server that we've seen a minute before, but well, it's just a number. I can decide by myself if I am happy with that or not. 
Let's look at a different server. Now we're testing the same domain, but now we're not asking that man use all DNS server, but instead we're going to a server hosted by APNIC. So test forward lookup. Using again the same parameters, I go. And look what's happening. So in the first second, I'm getting a total of like a dozen responses back. And then the server clamps up and goes like, well, hang on. No way. I, I know what you're doing. I'm limiting the, the responses here, and I won't give you anything. And I will now be on the blacklist for a couple of seconds. If I wait one or two minutes, I can rerun the test, and I will get exactly the same picture again. So in byte per second, you immediately notice this server is, for a DNS reflection attack, completely useless. We also get that report here that tells me amplification factor is zero, so well, not much about that. Um, let's try Aaron, the server hosted by Aaron. Again, repeat the same test, and off we go. So this one is more generous when it comes to responses. It also is sending a lot of um, uh, truncated flags. And the amplification factor is about two. So I'm sending, still sending out 20,000 bytes per second, getting back about 40,000, so not that useful for, um, for a botmaster. Um, here are a few links that describe how to configure DNS rate limiting on your server. Unfortunately, there are so many DNS implementations around that not all of and not all of the DNS implement uh, server implementations support DNS rate limiting. Um, so the ISC has, an, has uh, information about the bind server. NL Netlabs um, is uh, sponsoring the unbound server, and they support rate limiting. And I found some information from, from Microsoft for Microsoft's DNS implementation. If you, have, um, if you are aware of other DNS servers that support rate limiting, um, please let me know, because I, I find it interesting, and I would like to collect all the links so that I know, oh, that's, that server is uh, how we and, and how can we con uh, establish a configuration? Well, if you find that tool useful, you would find it on dnshammer.com, which is a domain that I wrote. Um, I have to warn you: nobody, literally nobody in the world, is using that program. Um, so, if you download it from my web server, the Microsoft virus scanner will kick in and go like, "Oh, that is a completely unknown program. Nobody has ever run it." Um, are you sure you want to run? And you downloaded it from the internet. It will tell you that I have applied my digital signature there. So I've uh, I got myself a code signing certificate. Unfortunately, I'm as a person not eligible for extended validation code signing. So it comes up with that warning. Mm. Well, so there's a hash code in there. Feel free to run whatever anti-malware test you have. I'm considering um, uh, publishing the source code. So and then you can do with it whatever you want. Um, I also wrote a small blog article on that. And um, before I take any questions, I would li like to show you what a really bad domain looks like. We go back to that test thing. We have a few more minutes, I guess. And I take a domain with just two characters, which is ey.com. Don't know who it belongs to. <laughs> I'll just give it a second to collect the information on the name servers. And I can pick any of these name servers here. Um, we make this one. I'll send it. We ask for 500 uh, any records, just for fun. Now, this tool has a few limits hard-coded into it. You cannot send more than 500 requests per second. That's intentionally so, because I think it should not be abused for for an attack. I don't want to create 
uh, absurd amounts of traffic, but that's an auditing tool. So 500 packets per se uh, requests per second is way more than enough for a single client. Um, also, the test duration is limited to two minutes. So you cannot enter a value here of more than 120 seconds. So that's it, go. It takes 10 seconds. So it freely answers what with everything. Now, we have to wait until that comes to an end. And the program will wait, just linger around for one or two seconds to collect late responses that might be somewhere uh, stuck on the network. And now, the amplification factor that we get is 63.2. I don't know what you think about it, but I feel for a DNA, if I were a bot master, that would be one of my go-to servers. So, and this is probably what you want, do not want to have on your network. And that tool is intended to help you find these servers, to check your configuration and find out if you're happy with it. Um, we have, I think, two or three more minutes. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, talk, uh, to take them. Yes, please. I start in, in the back. Hello. Um, hi. I, I used to work at RipeNCC, but not anymore. So <laughs> okay. So maybe I can say a thing or two. I wasn't involved directly with DNS, but what I think you're seeing there when you see the, yeah. the spike going down is because the RipeNCC uses clusters of uh, any custard DNS, like internally yeah. custard. So they, each one of them announces its own like the address they have on the loopback where they answer from. So what you're seeing is one of them stopping answering to you, and then you, you retry, and then you hit another one in the same pool. Okay. So I think that's what you're seeing there, and because uh, I think they, they are rate limited, uh, similar to APNIC, but the difference is that they are uh, any casted in, in uh, blocks in the same rack. Hang on, the, the point where it goes down, that came from the APNIC server. No, no. The one, oh, that goes, oh. it, the one in at Ripe has a uh, the the, the, the uh, right manuals uh, auth manual. Yeah, it goes yeah. down and then it has a spike later on, and that's probably because you're at that point you're hitting a separate instance in the same um, in the yeah. same bracket. Okay. So that I wanted to give a quick explanation yeah. to that. Okay. But then Thank you for I'm that. I'm pretty sure they are yeah. rate limited. So yes, I'm I'm also sure about that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, Will, I'm a connector. Uh, I'm Connect Working Group Chair for RIPE. So I'm, I'm not uh, part of the NCC, I'm just part of the community. And I would suggest that you come with this uh, presentation at, uh, with the, to the DNS Working Group at the next RIPE meeting, because that's really cool, I think. And I would also suggest, or I would ask, do you plan to do a Linux version of that? Well... <laughs> Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Now, here's a little something. I am truly a bad programmer. Um, and I'm pretty sure that a professional developer will look at the source code and immediately will call in sick and go like, no, I will go to bed for the rest of the day and turn off my monitor. Um, so this one has been written in Visual Studio. I'm willing to put this out as, um, uh, as, 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 as an open source tool, put the source code on GitHub. Um, and if anybody wants to make, wants to create a Linux fork from that, feel, feel free to do so. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Please use the microphone so we uh, record. I just think more important would be to have like some documentation so that maybe some about the internals of the, the application. So the concept used by the applications so that anybody can eventually implement like a Linux version. So we have that web page called dnshammer.com and um, it describes a little bit of DNS rate limiting. Um, and it, there's something like a user guide. It's not that complicated as a tool. Um, gives you a few starting ideas on, on how to work with it. And you see I even put RIPE up there on my documentation. Um, I, I meant more like the, the software internal, yeah. you know, documentation on how the software is implemented somehow, more than the, the user, the user ah, okay. software. Right? Yeah, well, I, can, yeah. uh, I can go back and, and add that to, yeah. the, uh, to, the, to, to the home page. Okay. Running and running and running. 
Um, so you said you work for the Canton of Argo. Yeah. Um, was this project sponsored by the Canton of Argo? No, it was not. Um, actually, I, I switched jobs, and uh, that was just between jobs I decided. Well, that's still for a long time on my mind. I decided, no, I do it. So it's my own work, and so um, it's not sponsored. So sorry, you cannot get supported from the Canton of Argo. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for writing in the yeah. spare time. Yeah. Yes, no? <laughs> yes, you work for, you was working for Canton? No, I, I am working. Yes, the, so yeah. you get the salary from them. And my question is, there maybe are some DNS administrators, they don't know that her um, DNS is um, uh, very, very good for a, for a attacker. Um, do you think you can inform your um, hostings in Argau to to tell them uh, you should change something? Well, we have a very precise charter of what we are responsible for, and that is the internal network of the Canton. We are not responsible for uh, the configurations of companies who are sitting or have a, a legal entity within the Canton of Argau. Um, I've discussed this tool with the GovCert, with Melanie, uh, here in Switzerland, which is uh, the coordinating body for all anti-malware activities in Switzerland. And the first domain that we've worked on was called govcert.ch, and they, you can look at that domain if you want to play around a bit with it, and you see how they have configured their, their system. And um, they, they would be the ones who reach out to uh, companies or individuals who are involved in a malware attack. So if you are in Switzerland and say you host a web server that is sending out malware or that is spamming around systems, there's a good chance that Melanie will contact you and go like, mm, you really should re fix your server. Okay, no more questions? Yeah, in my personal opinion, it would be really cool if you could um, release the source code, also because then we could change this limit of 500, yeah. you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Um, last question is, uh, is really if um, you said like you're not you're not a, um, a software engineer per se, um, uh, would it be possible maybe just to write you know a CLI client? So it would be probably also easier to you know to port it to Nano or, or some other framework. Currently, I have two things on my short-term roadmap. The one, is the first thing, and more, most pressing for me is, I want to support IP version six. So you see that we already identify IP version six addresses for name servers. And the second one would be maybe create a little button that delivers a report automatically, like um, enter a domain name and create an RTF file, for example, that delivers all the information with all the graphics and the reports and uh, pull all the name servers automatically, and then you can do with that report whatever you want. A CLI client, or a CLI version is, I, I think, possible, but I, I don't see that close in the future. I, depends a bit on, on the feedback that I get from, from the users' community. So that's actually probably the first time I'm talking about this project uh, in a, to a larger audience. And uh, so I very much value all your feedback that you give me on that. Thank you very much for your good work. Yeah, thank you.